Good morning. My name is Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Love Church. Welcome back. We're still doing our Colossians study, and uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless your word. We ask you to show yourself, show your face, reveal your presence to our heart and to our minds. Help us seek you as your word is being spoken. Father, speak through me. Help me understand. Help me relay what you want your people to hear. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge we can do nothing without you. Abide with us. Help us abide in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. So we're in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 through 13. For in him... The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. This is awesome. First off, I love this whole study, by the way, but this one really stands out to me. There are so many phrases right here, probably maybe in this book, but definitely I noticed the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The phrase, in Him, it appears like a lot, like, in Him, so walk in Him, built up in Him, for in Him, the whole fullness of deity you have been filled in him. In him also you are circumcised. With him. With him. And so I think the author is trying to tell us something. That in him. It says right here. In him. All the fullness dwells. Of God bodily. Some people say, well, Jesus can't be God because of whatever reason, right? But right here we read in verse 9, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Within one being, within one person, all of God dwells inside of him. And so I love this idea. I just, man... <laughs> I want to give you guys a story about what it means to be in him. Okay. So in him is like going into a house. You walk into a house. Right. You don't put your foot in or your arm in or half your body in. You walk in the house completely. You're fully in the house. And that house represents Jesus. Right. And so if Jesus is this house and you walk in him by faith, then everything, the fullness of God dwells in this house, which represents Jesus. If all of God lives in this house and this house represents Jesus and by faith, in Jesus and trusting in Jesus and his finished work on the cross, 
we enter into him. And we too have fellowship with him. We too have the blessings of everything in that house. Isn't that amazing? Every promise God ever gave to Abra- uh, Abraham, <laughs> to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, all the laws and the prophets, everything is fulfilled. All the blessings of God are found in him, in this house. And this house represents Jesus, his body. And so let's break it down. For in him, the whole fullness of deity lives, dwells, resides, occupies in his one, in his body. So when God so loved the world, he gave us his only son. He filled his entire self. He put his entire self in the person of Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is God because God is living inside of him 100%. And we have access to this. By trusting in Jesus, we enter the full glory of what's inside that house, which is God inside Jesus. And we too enter into Jesus by faith. And you have been filled in him. Like filling a cup. I've got some water here. I took this cup and I filled it. It's like one of the amazing analogies I've heard was imagine you take a bucket, right? Imagine that the ocean represents Jesus and God's infinite nature dwelling in Jesus. And you take that bucket and you drop it into the ocean and it sinks to the bottom. The bucket is in the ocean, but the ocean is also inside the bucket. Isn't that amazing? And that bucket is completely filled up. If Jesus represents the ocean in the infinite nature of God, and that bucket is inside the ocean, the bucket is in the ocean, and the ocean is filling up the the bucket. Who is the head of all rule and authority? Man, I want to tear this one up. For for awesome, this is awesome. Think about it. There are so many reasons to be afraid of. There's so many ways we can be afraid of all kinds of things. I mean, what's going on with our politics, our government, what's going on with another country, what's going on with... uh, Think the, you know, dictatorship in the home, you know, what's going on with bullies in school, whatever, if you're in school, you know, or, or, you know, bullies in general, you know, doesn't matter who you are. There's this fear that we have as human beings with authority. We all have it. We're, we're afraid for someone to judge us. We're afraid, you know, uh, to get pulled over, so to speak. We're afraid of authority. We're afraid of bullies. We are. We're totally afraid. We're afraid of the government. That's why we obey them, right? Most of us. We're afraid of our parents. We're afraid of being judged. We're afraid of getting, you know, sick and getting cancer, getting, you know, um, I can't really think of much diseases, diabetes. We're, we're constantly afraid of all these things as we live in this world. We are. We're afraid of what people think about us. We give power to these entities, to these people, to these authorities and rulers and principalities. We, give, we fear them. But right here, Jesus says he is the head of all of them. I'm going to let you think on that. He is the head of 
the entire universe. He's ahead of everything. I want to give you a good analogy. So imagine, you remember when you were little, you're in school or home or whatever, and you know, there's a bully or whatever, and they did something wrong to you as your relative, you know, your sister or your brother or or uh, someone at school did something wrong to you, what is the first thing that you do? You go tell someone who has greater authority than them. Right? We all do it. You know, when you're, if you're a guy, you know, you're like, my dad can beat your dad up. He has greater authority than your dad. He's stronger than your dad. We do that. Or big brother. Oh, you better not mess with me or I'm going to get someone who's stronger, who has more authority because they're stronger, right, than you. Or I'm going to call the cops because they have greater authority than you. They can put you in jail. But Jesus says right here that Paul writes, I'm sorry, Paul writes that Christ is the head of all authority. Whether it's the government, whether they're uh, police officers, uh, your parents, your the bullies. It doesn't matter who they are. And so he says we're sh we shouldn't fear them. If we are entering in this house, which represents Jesus in the fullness of God dwells inside this house and the fullness of the authority dwells inside this house. I'm preaching to myself <laughs> like I prayed earlier today. I'm like, God, what's up? You know, answering. <laughs> He's answering my own prayers as I speak. If the fullness of the authority dwells of God dwells in this house, we're not to be afraid of spirits. Or demonic angels. We're not to be afraid of the government. We're not to be afraid of what other people think about us, right? Or uh, parents or anyone. Even police officers or whatever. We're not to be afraid anymore because all the fullness and authority dwells in Jesus in this house. And we have entered into that house by faith. By trusting in Jesus. We shouldn't be afraid of COVID. We shouldn't be afraid of, you know, the riots. We shouldn't be afraid of anything because we are in Christ. And Christ is the head and rule and, author and has authority over everything in creation. So in other words, a person who fears God, who trusts in Christ or fears Christ, has nothing else to fear. If you trust in Jesus, there's nothing to fear. Nothing. No disease, no principalities and rulers of this world, physical or uh, not physical, spiritual. There's nothing to fear because let's go further. Christ has defeated them all by his death and resurrection. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In other words... The circumcision process was a physical cutting off of the flesh for males down below. If you follow what I'm saying. Right? It was a cutting off of, uh, this is spiritualized. It's cutting off the sinful nature. Our sinful nature fears the principalities and powers of this world. It fears the government. It fears, you know, uh, police officers it fears authority it fears all kinds of things right disease right that's why we buy insurance for like everything because we're afraid we buy house locks because we're afraid you know we buy guns because we're afraid we buy all these things trusting in these physical things these physical authorities who put fear over us you know you need insurance or this might happen right we do it with, oh, you need, you need, a, a, you need guns or <laughs> someone's going to rob you. Oh, you need, you know, the house security system or, you know, and we put our trust in these things instead of putting our trust in God who provides, not just provides, but provides protection as well. Normally, circumcision is done by a human being. Cutting off the flesh, the downstairs for men, right? When we're usually born. But here, Paul uses that as an imagery to show things that are happening spiritually. 
So God is not circumcising our downstairs. He's circumcising our hearts. He's cutting off the sinful nature of us. He's cutting off unbelief that he exists and that the spiritual realm is real and, you know, all that. God is cutting off the things that we... <coughs> God is cutting off everything that is not of him. And he's doing this inside of our heart. In other words, we can't change unless God changes us. We do evil things because we have a sinful nature. But when we put our faith in Jesus, Jesus' spirit, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of us. And he starts to chip away or cut off everything that is not good. Everything that is not holy. And he starts to replace those bad things that are living inside of us with good things like a desire to love God people can't love God in it and amongst themselves God has to put himself inside of us cut off the things that are not of him self and give us a desire to love him and that's what Paul is talking about right here when he uses this as an illustration in him also, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without physical hands. And this, so God is personally, Jesus is personally circumcising our hearts by putting off or cutting off the body of the flesh, cutting off the sinful nature inside of us by the circumcision of Christ, having buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead being Jesus so baptism represents our death it's a symbolic picture of us dying with Christ and through faith we are being resurrected into glory into God's kingdom so i'm going to i'm going to put it like i want to hmm Man, this is, hold on. This is some good stuff. I want you to imagine that there is two masters. One of them is Satan. And one of them is God, who is Jesus. One is standing to the right, one is standing to the left, directly before you. Let's just say Jesus is on the right because he's right, right? And, and Satan's on the left because he's wrong. And Jesus says, come to me, come to me. And Satan says the same thing. Come to me, come to me. Because we're born into sin, we obey Satan. And everything he tells us to do. From the moment we're born, we just go directly to Satan. We can't help it. We can't help but sin. We can't help but obey Satan and do whatever he tells us to do. So Satan says, come to me. We come to him. Satan says, go do this. We go do it. We can't not stop sinning. And even if we don't sin with our physical body, we do it in our heart. But when a believer or someone becomes a believer and they put their trust in Jesus, Jesus' spirit enters us. And Jesus says, come to me. And now we have the ability to obey Jesus. Now we have the ability to do what's right. But there's a battle going on inside of us between the old nature or person or old man living inside of us, our sinful nature that obeys Satan and the one that has Jesus' spirit that wants to obey his father. 
We cannot do this without the Spirit of Christ living inside of us. And we receive that Spirit when we believe in Jesus as our Savior and we are baptized unto our sinful nature as to represent our death to the old man or to the old woman or the old child or teenager or whatever you are and resurrected by trusting in Jesus. And as we daily trust in what Jesus did for us, he begins to circumcise our hearts. He begins to cut off the sinful nature of obeying Satan. But like I said, the wolf that you feed will manifest in our actions. So if we continue to feed our minds things that are unhealthy, then we will continue to obey Satan. But if we continue to open up the Bible and begin to read it and study it and pursue the things that are good, then we begin to manifest Christ-like behavior. We begin to obey God. And so there's this constant battle that we go through every day. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. We're in this constant battle between the flesh, our sinful nature, these bodies that are evil, and the Spirit of Christ that lives within us, wanting to go towards Jesus, wanting to do what God wants us to do. And so, as Paul describes right here, you must be filled in the Spirit, just like the cup analogy I use. You must allow Jesus to fill you up so everything you do reflects Him. him. Don't fill yourself up with things of this world, like the bad music, like politics, like all the nasty stuff, the bad movies and the bad books you shouldn't be reading. That is filling you up. And so what Paul is describing here is a circumcision that's happening inside the heart. A death, a spiritual death that's happening inside of our heart. And it's happening by faith. By faith and trusting in Jesus. Faith is like an umbilical cord. If we were a fetus, so to speak, inside a womb. And the one you connect yourself to is the one you'll grow up into. If you connect yourself to the evil things of this world, the evil media, the evil books, the evil television, the evil movies and music, then you will grow up reflecting that behavior. But if you connect yourself to Jesus, reading the word, praying, fasting, fellowshipping with other Christians, listening to sermons, continually dedicating yourself to God, then you will grow up and become like Jesus. And that's what Paul here is saying. When you have entered into Christ, you've entered in to this building that represents Jesus and all the fullness of God dwells inside this building. You've entered into this building by faith. In other words, you entered into this, into heaven, which is, which dwells inside of Jesus by connecting your self, your trust. Faith is another word for trust or belief. You've connected yourself to Jesus and what he did and what he was about and what he taught. His teachings, the word of God. You've connected yourself and you've entered in to Jesus by faith, by trusting in what Jesus did for us. That is the only way to enter into heaven. That is the only way to be circumcised, to, be, to have the evil nature cut off. To refine us. God is refining us. We cannot enter heaven unless we are perfect. So in and amongst our own power and strength, we cannot go into heaven. We need to be circumcised spiritually in the heart. We need to have the sinful nature completely cut off before we can enter into the promised land or into heaven or to, into paradise. And this happens when we put our trust in Christ. Christ starts to cut off our sinful nature day by day by day. The more we read our Bible, the more we pray, the more we fellowship, the more we go to church, the more we tune out this evil world. 
And Paul says, when you enter into this rest, enter into this paradise, the principalities cannot affect you, spiritual or physical. They cannot affect me. Because Christ is above all of them. He's above all the fear of this world, all the sickness, all the disease, all of it. He's above all the authorities of this world that constantly bully us to be afraid. He's above everything. And when we put our trust in Jesus, we enter into the one who is greater than all of these things. And then there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. We, are, we have so many fears. Disease. That's why we have insurance for everything. Tornado insurance. You know, being offended insurance. Hurricane insurance. We're afraid. We got guns. That's why we got guns because we're afraid. That's why we go to war. That's, that's why we do what we do because we're afraid. And Paul says this, those things, you're not, you shouldn't be afraid of those things anymore. Why? Because you have entered into the authority that is above all this. You went to big brother, so to speak, Jesus, who is above all principality and rule. And you too live in Jesus. And so you too, by your faith in Jesus, are above all the evil, all the principalities, all the authorities, all the rulers. There's nothing to fear anymore. But we cannot enter into that unless we first put our trust in Jesus. And as we daily put our trust in Jesus and walk it out, he begins to circumcise the evil, not just the evil nature that lives inside of us, that we do evil, but he begins to cut off the things that we fear self-perception, not having a good perception about ourselves or good perception of others, not being able to feel like you're comfortable in your own skin. He cuts off all that fear, all that doubt, all that anxiety, all the disease. And as Revelation describes it, there is a place called heaven where there is no more sickness. There is nothing to fear. The lion can lay down with the lamb. There's no more bullies. For God has defeated all these enemies. And we enter into that rest when we simply put our trust in Jesus daily. We begin to not fear things anymore. We begin to have complete joy and complete thanks and complete gratitude. You're like, I've got nothing to fear because what Jesus did for me and he does this daily. When I first became a Christian, I was afraid of a lot of things. And as I devoted myself to Jesus in scripture, prayer, reading, all the fears that I used to be afraid of, no longer afraid of. All the night terrors I used to have about things happening or things that I've experienced, I don't have that anymore. Because Jesus has defeated all of that. He's defeated all the authorities, all the bullies. And now I'm just like, the only person to fear is God. And that God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for listening. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you've defeated all these powers and authorities. You've defeated all these bullies of this system. We just thank you and we just put our trust in you. You're the only one to fear. For if we don't fear you, if we don't have a genuine fear of losing you, is what I'm saying. Fear of not having you, fear of not knowing you, then we are susceptible to be afraid of everything around us. We are insecure. Without you, we're terrified, we're frightened. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would save your listeners, whoever they are, if they don't believe, or you continue to strengthen their faith in you whatever they're going through. Fear of disease, fear of the government, fear of whatever. Continue to show them that you are God and no one else. You have all authority. And we enter into that rest when we trust in you and you alone. Thank you, Jesus, in your holy, holy, righteous name. God bless you guys.